Welcome to Case in Point, produced by the University of Pennsylvania Law School in collaboration with Bloomberg Law. Today, we'll be talking with Herb Hovenkamp, the James G. Dinan University professor with appointments here at Penn Law and also the Wharton School. Joining us remotely from Arlington, Virginia, is Liz Crampton, a reporter with Bloomberg Law. Liz, let's start with you. What signals are you seeing from the Trump administration about the direction that antitrust policy is taking? So there's been a bit of a delay in getting political appointees in place at the Justice Department and Federal Trade Commission. Just about a month ago, Assistant Attorney General Macon Delahim was sworn in. And over at the FTC, um, it's been run by an acting chairman, Maureen Olhausen, since early this year. And it has just two commissioners. Um, but the White House did recently name a permanent chair and other commissioners that will have to go through Senate confirmation. So that delay has stalled um, the rollout of a full antitrust agenda under Trump since the top decision makers weren't in place. Um, but we are seeing some steps. You know, at the FTC, Chairman Olhausen has been really interested in occupational licensing issues. Um, and despite just having two commissioners, the FTC has cleared some high profile mergers, such as Amazon's purchase of Whole Foods and Walgreens buying up a bulk of Rite Aid stores. Um, at the Justice Department, Del Rahim has signaled that he's really interested in um, global international cooperation um, and coordination um, with foreign officials. Um, and um, just this past week, and actually, the Justice Department um, filed an amicus brief um, in a dispute in Seattle over whether or not Uber and Lyft drivers can unionize. Um, and that brief represents a new initiative at the Justice Department to really um, ramp up its appellate program um, and file um, more briefs in cases that the, the federal government takes an interest in. So, you know, as, as the commission fills out and um, returns to its full five members and Del Rahim settles into his role, we'll, we'll see more policy initiatives rolled out. And Herb, what about in the judicial branch? What are some of the big cases that you're watching in the courts right now? Well, the biggest one is the cert grant in the American Express case, which was about oh, 10 or 12 days ago, which is a, it's a Sherman Section 1 case that involves an anti, allegedly anti-competitive agreement between American Express and merchant banks that very largely prevents American Express customers from having any incentive to use a different credit card than American Express or, uh, or cash. I mean, a merchant might, because American Express fees are very high, merchants would prefer uh, that uh, their customers use a different credit card or pay cash, but they are not allowed to give them any cash uh, incentives or even tell them that they can get a better rate uh, by using a different card. Uh, the district court found that to be illegal under the antitrust laws and then uh, the Second Circuit in uh, New York uh, reversed the district court. case is very interesting because uh, the Justice Department initially brought the case, lost in the Second Circuit, uh, and then after the election, uh, this, the Justice Department decided not to pursue uh, a Supreme Court a Supreme Court grant, uh, but there were several states' attorneys general involved, and the state of Ohio is finally the named plaintiff that won one cert. So it's going to be a very important case. So let's take a, a little bit of a step back. What is exactly at stake in some of these antitrust issues? Is it just about one or two companies dominating a market? Is it about a lack of uh, meaningful choice for consumers? What are we talking about when we talk about antitrust? Well, in that particular case, uh, American Express is really not a dominant firm. It shares, it's a big firm, but the general purpose credit card market is shared with Visa, MasterCard, and uh, discover and the real issue in the case is uh, whether American Express is entitled under the antitrust laws to prevent customers from having certain kinds of information that might lead them to substitute uh, to a card other than American Express or to a debit card or or to pay to pay cash. Uh, Liz, you started off talking about some of your work. Um, about what the Justice Department is doing, both domestically and globally, on antitrust. Um, so what are some highlights of their antitrust enforcement and tracking? And what are the other agencies doing to support or um, be involved in antitrust policy? 
So as I said, um, Del Rahim, the NHS chief, chief at the Justice Department, is really big on increasing communication with foreign antitrust officials. Uh, he views enforcement as you know, critical to ensuring a free fair market system, especially one that's ground in economics. Um, so expect to see more cooperation in that space. Um, the Justice Department has been active in NAFTA renegotiations. Mm -hmm. They worked with the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative to craft a competition chapter. Um, and while the fate of NAFTA renegotiation is uncertain, officials have said that they will continue to work in that area and hope to incorporate competition chapters and in, in other trade agreements. And her, your written work focuses a lot on um, legal history. So what can those, what can some of the large seminal antitrust cases like Standard Oil tell us about kind of the future of antitrust regulations? Particularly I'm thinking here of in um, the areas of technology of Facebook and Google. Well, uh, Standard Oil was a good victory and a bad remedy. That's one thing I think we've learned since 1911. The case is more than 100 years old now. Uh, uh, the government got a victory in the Standard Oil case and then proceeded to break Standard Oil up into uh, roughly 50 small companies, many of which remained monopolists or dominant firms in their areas. Uh, it was kind of a poorly designed remedy. Uh, and, uh, and, and Mr. Dalla Harim is very, very uh, concerned about appropriate remedies in antitrust cases. I think he's thinking this through right now when he's contemplating uh, the merger between AT&T and uh, Time, War Time, uh, Time Warner. Uh, the AT&T settlement, the other, the other case I, th I think you referred to, uh, I think is as one of the more successful uh, antitrust outcomes in, in the United States. It occurred during the first Reagan administration and broke up the, self, the telephone company and has turned the telephone company from a top-to-bottom regulated monopoly into uh, largely a competitive firm at all levels right now, which means local service, long-distance service, and telephone uh, instruments. I think the most relevant case, however, for technology today is, is the 2001 Microsoft case in the, two, in the uh, D.C. Circuit, uh, which uh, condemned Microsoft for various ap acts of monopolization, did not break Microsoft up, but imposed some conduct remedies on it. Mr. Delarim has, has gone on record as not being very enthusiastic about conduct remedies. These are remedies where you order people to behave a certain way. Uh, and I, I, frankly, I think the record after Microsoft indicates that uh, most of those remedies were not particularly effective. Now, the, the Microsoft's products, at least some of them, are more competitive today than they were 15 years ago, but I really don't think the antitrust decree had much of anything to do with it. A lot of that resulted from technological changes. Um, Liz, getting back to uh, global markets, what are some of the issues Americans' firms are facing in China and the EU? So the hot case right now is the EU's investigation into Google's search practices um, earlier this year um, in, in relation to its shopping services. And earlier this year, the EU um, fined Google a record $2.7 billion for um, how it ex um, displayed um, search results of its rivals on its, its shopping, shopping pages. Um, and Google has reportedly made an offer to the EU to resolve those concerns, and the EU is considering that. Um, in China, there is a worry among um, some in the U.S., particularly on Capitol Hill, that China um, discriminates against U.S. companies um, via its antitrust enforcement, um, which is one of the reasons why Del Rahim has adopted this issue. Yeah, let me add something to that. I, I, I agree with all of that. I think in terms of getting unification as between the U.S. and particularly the EU, the Google case is one of the biggest problems he faces. I think in that particular area, which is a, a, abuses by dominant firms, the U.S. and the EU are getting further and further apart. Uh, you know, most of the highly innovative firms uh, that have gotten on the wrong side of antitrust uh, 
issues in the, in the last 10 years or so have been American firms. And I think the Google case in the EU tells us why. Uh, the EU, it's not so much a bias against American firms. I agree, that's true of ch the Chinese. But uh, the EU Competition Authority basically puts landmines in the way of highly innovative firms. Uh, and that's what's going on right now in the case of, uh, of Google. And uh, I think that explains and justifies why the U.S. and the EU have taken such different positions on that particular set of issues. Can you give us some examples of those kinds of landmines that are particularly problematic? Well, this is a case that involves a dominant firm's duty to help out competitors. So Google Search is a unilaterally created uh, search engine. It's one of many search engines. Uh, it's uh, a default search engine, which means that uh, for many devices, such as Android phones, it's the one you get when you buy your phone, but you can change it. Mm -hmm. uh, today, if you want a dozen different search engines on your smartphone or your laptop or desktop, you can have them. Uh, but the EU, in my view, has been listening way too much to competitors, and they are not necessarily small competitors. I mean, one of them is Microsoft, for example, that want more and more micromanagement of the Google uh, search algorithms, search strategies, uh, in order to create what they would consider to be a more level playing field. Uh, and the EU has listened to that, and, and what I find fairly disturbing is that they're not paying very much attention to consumers. Mm -hmm. you know, in the United States, we always look at consumers first when we do antitrust. We, we favor low prices, high output, and we measure antitrust success in terms of consumer satisfaction. And the consumer element in the EU Google case uh, is very largely ignored in favor of listening to competitors. Um, Herb, I'd like to talk for a minute about your work writing about um, different presidential administrations, how they do in terms of the economy and job growth, um, and how that correlates with their antitrust policy. Can you share um, your thoughts about what this means for us now when we have one party controlling all three branches of the government? Well, what it means depends pretty much on how that party listens, and right now I'm not particularly optimistic about that. But, um, you know, the historical data are pretty uncontroversial. The, economy does much better under democratic administrations. If you look back the last century or so, it's done roughly twice as good. Now we generally throw Hoover at one side and Franklin Delano Roosevelt at the other side out as outliers uh, because, you know, the Hoover administration had the worst economic record of all presidencies since the 1920s, but that gives Hoover pretty much uh, responsibility for the depression. The FDR administration had the best, but of course that was substantially because of the recovery from the depression and perhaps more importantly the lead up to World War II. But even if you throw those aside, it's democratic administrations have produced about almost twice, about 1.7 times as much economic growth per year as uh, Republican administrations. Annually, they create roughly twice as many jobs. Uh, the record is not controversial. The explanations for it are. Uh, my personal view is that Democrats overall have been more pragmatic when it comes to business policy. They've been less ideological, less concerned about uh, appointing, you know, libertarians or conservatives as such, and more concerned about solving problems frequently empirically. Uh, and the result, I think, shows up as better economic performance. Great. Well, thank you both for joining us. This has been a fascinating conversation. And thank you for joining us in Case in Point.